sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all the songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains, repeat the song, be joy. Our chalice lighting this morning comes from Marjorie Montgomery. Life is a gift for which we are grateful. We gather in community to celebrate the glories and the mysteries of this great gift. Today, as we settle in to celebrate all of the glories and mysteries of Christmas, we remember the gifts, small and large, invisible, invisible, and visible, that touch us every day. Thank you. 
hugs given and Merry Christmases said. When the special breakfast has been eaten and the phone calls to family and friends far away have been made. When the excitement and the magic and the rush of Christmas morning fades, or perhaps when the luxurious sleeping in turns into warm coffee by the window and the quiet solitude of Christmas morning lengthens, the story and the wonder remain. All around the globe we come across distance and time to tell the story and feel again the wonder. We come to remember once more the sacredness of each birth, the joy of shared work taken on with love and compassion, the urgency of Jesus' call to justice and peace made with our own hands. We come in the glory of a new morning to hear the story once more, the voices of the angels and the cry of the baby as if they were ours to hear. Indeed, they are ours to hear. We come to celebrate, to rejoice, to revel, and to be together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born for you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace to those on earth. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. For so the children come, and so they have been coming, always the same way they come, created by our seeds, our souls, our love. No angels herald their beginnings. No prophets predict their future courses. No wise men see a star to show where to find the babe that will save humankind. Yet, each night a child is born is a holy night. Parents sitting beside their children's cribs feel glory in the sight of new life beginning. They ask, where and how Will this new life end, or will it ever end? Each night a child is born is a holy night, a time for singing, a time for wondering, a time for worshiping. Thunder rumbles in the mountain passes and lightning rattles the eaves of our houses. Floodwaters await us in our avenues. Snow falls upon snow, falls upon snow to avalanche over unprotected villages. The sky slips low and gray and threatening. We question ourselves. What have we done to so affront nature? We worry, God. Are you there? Are you there really? Does the covenant you made with us still hold? And into this climate of fear and apprehension, Christmas enters, streaming lights of joy, ringing bells of hope, and singing carols of forgiveness high up in the bright air. The world is encouraged to come away from rancor, come the way of friendship. It is the glad season. Thunder ebbs to silence and lightning sleeps quietly in the corner. Floodwaters recede into memory. Snow becomes a yielding cushion to aid us as we make our way to higher ground. Hope is born again in the faces of children. It rides on the shoulders of our aged as they journey into their sunsets. Hope spreads around the earth, brightening all things, even hate, which crouches breeding in dark corridors. In our joy, we think we hear a whisper. At first it is too soft, then only half heard. We listen carefully as it gathers strength. We hear a sweetness. The word is peace. It is loud now. It is louder, louder than the explosions of bombs. We tremble at the sound. We are thrilled by its presence. It is what we have hungered for, not just the absence of war, but true peace a harmony of spirit, a comfort of courtesies, security for our beloveds and their beloveds. We clap hands and welcome the peace of Christmas. We beckon this good season to wait a while with us. We, Baptist and Buddhist, Methodist and Muslim, say, come peace, 
Come and fill us and our world with your majesty. We, the Jew and the Janus, the Catholic and the Confucian, implore you to stay a while with us so we may learn by your shimmering light how to look beyond complexion and see community. It is Christmas time, a halting of hate time. On this platform of peace, we can create a language to translate ourselves to ourselves and to each other. At this holy instant, we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ into the great religions of the world. We jubilate the precious advent of trust. We shout with glorious tongues at the coming of hope. All the earth's tribes loosen their voices to celebrate the promise of peace. We, angels and mortals, believers and non-believers, look up heavenward and speak the word aloud, peace. We look at our world and speak the world aloud, peace. We look at each other, then into ourselves, and we say without shyness or apology or hesitation, peace, my brother, peace, my sister, peace, my sibling, peace, my neighbor, peace, my soul. Here ends our reading. that one of the joys and lessons of the Christmas season is the importance of our generosity. Christmas asks us to view our world through the lens of abundance, sharing with each other gratitude for the many gifts of our lives. This abundance calls us to share with each other, changing the economy of greed and consumerism towards an economy of the community. We know that by giving, we are ensuring that people have all they need. In the spirit of this Christmas lesson, the offertory for this service goes to the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. UUSC is our denomination's outreach branch of social justice. They serve communities both locally, nationally, and around the world. They have initiatives in justice education and leadership development, advocacy, grassroots partnerships, and they help bring justice works into your congregation. Your donation helps to build a better world. Please visit donate.uusc.org slash give slash 188649 or go to uusc.org and click on donate 
to give to UUSC. This offering will now be gratefully and joyfully received. tree last night and pondering why again we slay a perfectly healthy tree 10 years of age not even a teenager yet and prop up the body and drape it with frippery and then finally feed the brittle former fibrancy into a chipper pay a grim boy scout five bucks for the privilege I watched mine bride and children quietly for a while from behind the tree where I was struggling with that haunted, cursed string of lights. And I saw the under genius of it all. I saw beneath the tinsel and nog, the snarl of commerce, the ocean of misspent money. I saw the quiet pleasure of ritual, the actual, no kidding, no fooling, urge to pause, to think about other people and their joy, the anticipation of days spent laughing and, and shouldering in the kitchen with no agenda and no press of duty. I saw the flash of peace and love under all the shrill selling in tinny theater, and I was thrilled 
I moved. And then I remembered too that the ostensible reason for all was love being bold and brave enough to assume a form that would bleed and break and despair and die. And I was again moved and abashed. And I finished untangling the epic knot of lights, shivering again with happiness that we were given such a sweet and terrible knot of a world to untangle as best we can with bumbling love. And so, amen. May we all be so blessed in our common task to untangle the sweet and terrible knot of the world. May your holiday be merry and bright. May the world know peace and joy. May the coming year be filled with justice and compassion. Let us pray. Good with us, God with us. After a whole season of waiting and wondering and a long journey under a shining star, the blessed day has finally dawned. The baby has been born. Christmas is here. Good with us, God with us. So much of our lives we spend searching, waiting, questioning. So much about this world of ours is uncertain and unpredictable. To search and question is holy and it is humble. But when hope and peace, joy and love, when truth is born in us and in our world, it's time to set everything aside and just adore and give thanks. Good with us, God with us, we give thanks for this day of giving and receiving this yearly chance to remember that the hope of the world isn't born to kings or princes, Congress people or presidents, but to the poor, the marginalized, the exploited. We give thanks for this day to remember that truth has come to birth in our world against all odds to challenge the powers of the world that lead to death and that we can be sharers in this truth. Good with us, God with us. We give thanks for the gift of the love that gave us life, that holds us and grounds our being in all things. Love beyond belief. Love that never lets any of us go. Amen. The story starts in 1843 in a small town, Rocamore, France. The town had just gotten their uh, organ renovated and the parish priest wanted to mark the occasion, celebrate in some way. 
He asked a local townsperson, Placide Capot, if he would write a poem for the event. Capot was a very interesting person. Um, he had lost his hand when he was eight years old. He and a friend were playing and his friend shot it off. Gun safety has apparently always been an issue when it comes to children. Um, but he had gone to the university. He even, even with that, he had won an award um, for his artwork. Uh, he also was, he had studied law, um, but literature was his great love. Anyway, he was asked to write a poem for this occasion. He said yes and wrote the poem, Minuit Chrétiens, or Midnight Christians. Pleased with it, Capot then asked Adolf Adam, a uh, French composer, if he would write music for the poem. Adolf did, and Cantique de Noël was born. The song instantly became popular, and it was uh, sung at many midnight mass services. And then someone happened to look a little closer at its creators because you see Capot was an open socialist and atheist, and Adolf Adam was Jewish. The Catholic Church hierarchy did not like this at all and began telling everyone not to play it, banned it, uh, said that it musically was not very good and not very religious. But the song was already out there and the French people loved it. Now, Right around this same time over in the United States, John Sullivan Dwight was trying to figure out what his vocation was. He had gone to Harvard and he had even in 1840 been ordained a Unitarian minister. However, it turns out that he was extremely timid. Well, he was afraid of speaking in public. His stage fright was so bad that he simply could not become a preacher. So he turned to his other love, which was music, uh, doing musical events, teaching, and then beginning a, a music journal. It was through that work that he became familiar with Cantique de Noel and fell in love with it, especially a line that talked about slave. You see, Unitarian John Sullivan Dwight was also an ardent abolitionist. Dwight took Cantique de Noel, and it was not a literal translation, but he was trying to, um, to communicate the spirit of the song. But the third verse, the third verse is where he got really clear about his abolitionist leanings. Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. He published his translation in his journal, and so then the song in the United States became extremely popular, especially among the abolitionists. So, what a group project, right? Enjoy O Holy Night, brought to you courtesy of a socialist atheist, a Jewish composer, and a Unitarian.
years ago, I had one of the worst traveling experiences of my life. My spouse and I were driving from Boston to Washington, D.C. to visit my family on Christmas Day. And this was after we had both had late nights leading Christmas Eve services with our congregations. And I was five months pregnant. The drive took a long time, and after about the hundredth time we stopped so I could use the bathroom, I remember saying sarcastically, how could this get any worse? And then I thought of Mary and Joseph and their 70-mile journey on donkey back. Though we had felt anxious going so far from my midwife, we knew that if anything happened, there were hospitals and midwives along the way to help. And while our trip was certainly uncomfortable for me, we traveled safe roads through free land so we could feast and celebrate with my family. Joseph and Mary's trip couldn't have been more different. Theirs was a dangerous trek, dangerous because the land they traveled was occupied territory. And because when the occupying Roman bullies said jump, or in this case, go back to where you were born to be counted in a census, all a poor Jewish couple could do was ask how high. It's easy to forget what the world was like back then, though in many ways it was much like it is today. Caesar Augustus had just taken the Roman throne and soon after been hailed the savior of the world, the son of a god, the prince of peace. Of course, his piece, known as the Pax Romana, wasn't good for everyone. What history books call progress never is. No, the peace of Augustus wasn't really peace at all for anyone who wasn't rich or Roman. His so-called peace was possible only by keeping ethnic minorities and peoples Rome conquered poor and powerless. But this Pax Romana was supposed to make Rome great again. So, of course, any resistance to it would have been met with swift force. This is the subtext when the angel Gabriel visits Mary and tells her she'll become pregnant with a savior whose reign would have no end. And later, when another angel appears to Joseph in a dream and assures him that Mary's unborn child would bear a name that means God is with us. And later, when more angels appear to some shepherds to tell them that a new kind of peace, a peace that is good news for all people, had just been born. If this news is good for people like them, it was sure to make the Caesars of the world upset. No wonder angels always start things off by telling people not to be afraid. These stories within stories hold different meaning for each of us. Whatever these Christmas stories mean to you, they are powerful because they bear timeless truth. And some of the truth of these stories within many stories is that the miracle, the hope of the world, the good news for all people isn't to be found where we might expect it. These stories urge us to look for real, enduring hope, not in tax plans or congressional bills or anywhere in the hallways of power. They beckon us to draw near to the hope that's born not among the wealthy and the powerful, but among the poor, the oppressed, the refugee. That's where the kind of hope and peace, joy and love that can change the world are born. Now, I know it's easy to doubt whether that changed world is possible. An earth transformed, a world where peace reigns, how could that really happen? It's hard to even imagine, let alone have faith, will actually happen, could actually happen. I know it might feel at times like the problems that plague our states, our country, our planet will go on forever. Like things might never get better. But that feeling, that exact feeling, is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about a teenage girl saying an enthusiastic yes, even though she knew she risked being stoned to death for becoming pregnant out of wedlock. Christmas is about a man going against cultural expectations and accepting Mary's child as his own on nothing more than a dream. 
It's about hope being born to the most unlikely people, not in a palace, but in an animal's food dish. It's about a family who escapes a tyrant's murderous schemes by seeking refuge in a faraway land. This kind of Christmas story might not belong on a Hallmark card, but it does belong here, inside of our minds, where it can interrupt our doubts about whether the world will ever change. This kind of Christmas story belongs here, in our hearts, so we remember the power that brings down tyrants from their thrones and lifts up the lowly, that fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich empty away, that power that's changed the world before, will again. This kind of Christmas story belongs in our spirits, where it can move and shape us into people who want to say yes, even when it's risky. People who do the work of finding the lost, healing the broken, feeding the hungry, releasing the prisoner, rebuilding the nations, bringing peace to all people, and making music in the heart all year long. That is the work of Christmas. And as we do this work, may hope, peace, joy, love, and truth do their work within us. Merry Christmas. Amen. When the songs of the angels are stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among others, to make music in the heart. The work of Christmas is the work of justice, the work of mercy, the work of grace. It is the work of love. May this day, however we spend it and whoever we spend it with, be a day of remembrance and rejoicing. Remembrance of the holiness of each being and of this world we call home. Remembrance of our place in creation and the sacredness of the everyday. Remembrance of our capacity to change the world when we bring our whole selves to compassion and commitment. Rejoicing in the love that burns and yearns in all things. Rejoicing in the stories and celebrations that move our hearts. Rejoicing in these lives we are given and in the magic of existence. Let this day be a day of joy unbound. So I am. Thank you for spending this Christmas morning with us. We extinguish our chalice, but not the commitment to the messages of this day. Even as the flame goes out, the spark of love within us remains kindled. For each baby born, for all of our human family, for this earth we share. May the challenge and the call of Jesus, the comfort and the love of this time together echo throughout your day. And may the peace of Christmas be yours to hold and to create each and every day. Merry Christmas and go in peace. Oh, 
Oh, 